Good morning, Restore. Come on in. If you're getting coffee, please come join us. Welcome to church this morning. My name is Andrew Holsebus. I'm one of the worship leaders here at Restore, and I'm so happy to be here this morning. I am excited to worship our Lord and Savior. I had the opportunity to go to a concert Friday night, a Phil Wickham concert, and it was the first time in a long time that I could join with, I don't know, a thousand, maybe two thousand other people and worship the Lord right in song. And it was good to be lifted up and join our voices together. And it made me think about the throne room of heaven and that a Sunday in heaven, I think, starts like Saturday morning. My timing is probably off. But if you think about when a day starts in like Japan and they start worshiping the Lord on a Sunday morning and as the world spins, more and more Christians around the world start to sing and join in one voice, praising our Heavenly Father. And what a worship set that must be in the throne room of God as we join voices together. So this morning, I'm going to invite you to stand, to join us as we join with the Capital C Church around the world this morning as we praise our Lord and Savior. I want to hear you guys sing loud.
that sound in the middle of that song. I thought that was like, it was like the last sound the dinosaurs heard, I think, before it was like, anyway, uh, thanks for being here this morning, for joining us for worship. Uh, we at Restore like to keep things simple, so we focus on four things, the word of God, the worship of God, the community of God, and the mission of God. We're going to do that this morning by opening up God's word to see what he would say to us to celebrate God through a time of worship, to hear what God is doing in our community through a time of announcements and by encouraging one another to live on mission. So two things we always say up front because we want it to be uh, just something that we always remember about who we are. Number one is we're a generous community. And so we don't shy away from talking about giving and, and from thanking God for all the generosity that he's bestowed on us as individuals and families and also on our church. And this Restore Church wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the generosity of everyone and all its members. Uh, and if you are here in person, everybody nowadays gives online at donate.restoreworship.org, or if you're online, you can do the same thing. Secondly, we always want to say hello. So if you're new with us online today, or maybe you're here and it's your first time, there, uh, if you're here, there's a card right in front of you in the pews behind you, but you can also go to connect.restoreworship.org on your phone, and that's where we, we just, all we ask for is your email address. We want to be able to stay connected with you, let you know what's going on throughout the week, and if you're here in person, we have a gift for you out front. There will be somebody waiting by the front table there to just hand you something just to remind you of us, and we would love to be able to tell you what's going on as part of this church. So as we continue in worship this morning, let me pray for us. Father, we are grateful that we could be here in this building to worship, to gather uh, in, on this spring day, to, Lord, think about everything that Andrew already reminded us of this morning, that when we gather for worship, whether we're here in this building, whether we're online, we're virtual, Lord, we are gathering and worshiping with the Big C Church, the Universal Church, Lord. We're, not, we're just a local outpost. We're just one expression of the worship of God. Um, but all across the globe, all across the nation, Lord, are those who are um, worshiping you as well. So be with us, Lord, uh, during this time. I pray this in your name. Amen. Running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
I think before the parable of the rich young man listen pay attention stop see what the Lord is doing see I thought about this word behold and when I looked at and researched a little bit oftentimes seeing is a part of beholding but seeing can only do so much right we can see we can physically see but seeing stops when you close your eyes it's that simple beholding does not stop when you close your eyes you can still close your eyes and know and behold the Heavenly Father. So as we sing this new song that Katie and Joey introduced last week, I want you to think about beholding our Heavenly Father and His Son. And so I invite you to maybe close your eyes and maybe lift your hands as we sing Behold Him.
Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to praise you this morning, the opportunity to join with millions of voices around the world, Lord. I pray that it was a sweet aroma and a sweet sound to you. We love you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thanks, worship team, for leading us this morning. I have a couple of announcements for us. So first of all, um, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Romy and his family were here, and they shared just a little bit about what God was doing in their lives. And they uh, shared about one of the opportunities that we could have to serve alongside of them in the city of Patterson this summer. And that was at the Big Give on June 25th. So I just wanted to share a little bit more about that event and the ways that uh, each of us and us as a church family can partner with their family. So first, uh, I would ask all of us just to consider, are there things that we might be willing to donate? So this event is going to be like a massive garage sale uh, that Pastor Romy and some other, hopefully some other churches are going to be partnering with him. And we're going to bring uh, like furniture, clothing, and other household items to this event. Uh, and then families from Patterson are able to come and pick uh, some of the things that they would like. Uh, so I would ask for each of us to consider are there things that we could donate from our own houses or um, some families that we might know to invite to be a part of that. There is a lot more information on their website, uh, which is going to be, which is Oak Church nj.org slash big give oak church dot oak church nj.org slash big give and there's a whole list of items that they're looking for and the ways that you can help prepare um, you can also drop those off uh, there's a couple of different locations before the event or you can drop it off on the day of in the morning june 25th between 9 and 11 a.m and then we could also partner by serving at the event so there's volunteers needed throughout the entire day, whether it's setup, teardown, or manning one of the stations, or maybe you want to help uh, with organizing the week before. And all of that information is on the website as well. If you have questions about it, though, feel free to email me at joey at restoreworship.org, or you can just come and talk to me after the service. I'd love to chat more about that. And then also, I have something exciting uh, to share about something that we're starting this summer. So we are going to launch a, a life group for young adults beginning on May 31st. So our first gathering is going to be that evening from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, the Westras, Mike and Sandy, have offered to host that for us. There's going to be food there. We're going to talk about kind of what our goal for the summer is. Um, but hopefully... We just want to create a space for us to build relationships, uh, to go deeper into relationship with Christ and serving one another and serving together and just living on mission, kind of the things that we like to do here uh, on Sunday mornings, just getting a little bit more intimate with that gathering. So if you're inter- interested in that, you can also email me at joey at restoreworship.org or come talk to me after the service. Uh, it's going to be a blast. We're going to just launch it through Uh, the end of this summer. And then finally, if you are a child kindergarten or first grade, you may go to the back and we have already seen one just dart out. (laughs) You know what to do. All right. Thank you. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, we now we enter into this time where we're going to look at your word, look at the ministry of your son, Jesus Christ. And so we raise up our prayers as a community. Lord, we raise up our gratitude as a church for the generosity of the people here. Lord, that we would be good stewards of all that they have given, um, that we then could use this ministry for the good of the community, for the advancement of your kingdom. Father, we raise up our eyes and we look to the world around us and we look at the communities around us and, and we pray this morning for all of those hurting in Buffalo, Father, to, to see once again the, uh, the, the blight on our society of racism 
And to see it happen and to see so many lose their lives and so many communities damaged because of it, Father, we pray for comfort for those who are hurting. We lift our eyes further, Lord, and we pray for those in the Ukraine. We continue to pray that evil would be pushed back, that the people would be restored, that uh, dignity would be affirmed, that people would be kept safe, Lord. Uh, and we ask that you intervene by any means necessary, even supernatural, uh, if you desire, Lord, to end that conflict and to end that violence. And now, Father, we come and we look at ourselves as we come to the text today and consider, Lord, how it is that we are, uh, how we see ourselves as members of the kingdom of heaven. So be with us, Lord, in your name. Amen. We've, so we've been considering the kingdom of heaven in the gospel of Matthew since before Christmas. Here's how Matthew summarizes the teaching of John the Baptist and how he summarizes the message of Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we've looked at this. This is part 18 in the series, so we've, in, in after Christmas. So we've looked at this from a number of different ways. But here's the main thing I want us to think about today. That, when, that what Jesus is saying to us is that those who are serious about coming and understanding Jesus' teaching come with a heart that says, show me where I need to repent. What do I need to turn from? We all have distortions. We have distortions that we know about, and we have distortions we don't know about. So we come and we say, what do I, because repentance is just a simple turning, a simple realignment with the way that God has called us to live. To say, yes, God's kingdom, his values are correct and mine aren't. So we have these distortions, we turn from them, we repent, we come into alignment with how God has called us to live. And so as this message has continued to go out, there's a growing conflict between Jesus and the, king, the secular kingdom on the one hand, but, but also very clearly the kingdom of religion. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of religion are coming up against one another because the kingdom of heaven is calling us to repentance and the kingdom of, of religion, represented by the religious leaders, is calling us to something else. And we've seen that contrast all throughout this gospel because the Pharisees, they want to go to the crowds. Jesus wants to leave the crowds and go to the mountain. You know, we, we see it in the ways that the Pharisees are testing Jesus with questions intended to trick him. We see it in Palm Sunday and Easter when Jesus comes in and he clears the temple and he's clearly calling out the uh, Pharisees, the scribes, and the other religious leaders. Matthew is highlighting that Jesus' teaching of the kingdom of heaven is not like the kingdom you assumed it would be. That the kingdom of heaven is a total rethinking of the way that things really are. That when we come into the kingdom of heaven, our eyes are open to the way Jesus reinterprets everything that we thought and everything about the way that we thought things should be. It's a whole new way of seeing the world and what God is doing in it. So when we come to the text, the question is always the same for us. What do I need to turn from? What do I need to repent of? What do I need to, to turn from in order to live in alignment with this new kingdom of heaven and this new way of thinking? The problem is that, first of all, um, and that most of the time, we don't want to do that, number one. But second of all, the distortions that we actually need to turn away from are so deep-rooted in our lives that we don't really even want to acknowledge them, or we're not re ready to acknowledge them, or we're not ready to see them. And we saw that when we looked at marriage and sexuality, and then we looked at wealth. It was, you know, there's these distortions that we bring to the table that we go, I don't really want to have Jesus root those things out. That's why we need the Spirit. We can't just do it on our own because there's places of our hearts that need to be illuminated to see where it is that I need to repent, which is the reason that I wanted to skip the passage that we're looking at today because I don't like it. And I, and I legitimately, I was like, you know what? I, we did marriage, sexuality, we did wealth. That was challenging for all of us. Chris wrapped it up with a nice bow, labors in the vineyard. Let's just call it a day. There's, there's one other passage in the kingdom of heaven that we're going to cover next week. That's not as like, you know, it's not as bad. This, but this one today, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. And uh, I was like, oh, we don't need to do that one. You know, it's not, and then I read it again and I was like, oh no, like we have to do that one because he's speaking to us and he's speaking to everybody who grew up in the church. He's speaking to everybody who's a religious person. He's speaking to everybody who is an American Christian. Every single one of us is the one who Jesus is speaking to. And this is his message. Woe to you, you hypocrite. That's why I don't want to do it. Okay. Because I'm going, I am well aware that Jesus is speaking to me through this passage He's speaking to you through this passage. The question is, will we have ears to hear? Will, are we willing to uncover 
the distortions that we have in our own lives. Now, I'm not going to read all of Matthew 23, but we are going to go through the entirety of the chapter, and I'll highlight some things. But I'm going to start with Matthew 23, verses 1 to 12, because this, is, this frames the context. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no one man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Now there's something that we need to understand as we start, and that's that Jesus says to, the, to his followers about the Pharisees and the scribes is that they sit on Moses' seat. And he says, so do what they teach you, but not what they do. Now that's really important because Jesus is making a distinction between the word of God and what's in the way that it's being presented. In every synagogue in, in, in Judaism, in first century Judaism, there was a seat, there was a prominent chair called the Moses seat. And that was where the authoritative, remember I said that rabbis were supposed to interpret the Old Testament scripture. So the authoritative interpreter in every uh, synagogue would sit on this Moses seat. Now I have a picture of it here. It does look a little bit like a toilet, not going to lie to you. I, we did mock our teacher uh, and take pictures of him. But this is the Moses seat in one of the synagogues that was built up. And the authoritative interpreter would sit on that seat, and he would teach from the Torah, and he would teach from the, the Hebrew Scriptures. So Jesus says, makes very clear, they're teaching you the word of God, so do what they do. Teach what they teach, or listen to what they're saying, but don't listen to the way that they're presenting it. The problem is what, that what the religious leaders have done is they have made themselves the center of the story. The, the religious leaders have made themselves the example of what it means to live out the Torah. They, they are the ones who've made it out that they are the ones who are nailing it and everyone else should be looking to them. In other words, the sin of the Pharisees is self-righteousness. This is what Jesus is going to be talking about through the rest of Matthew 23 that the reason that he calls out seven woes on the Pharisees and scribes, and we'll look at what that is, but the reason that he says this right here and frames his context is because he says they are self-righteous. They make it look to everyone around them that the only person who can follow the law is them. They are the ones who are pleasing to God. It, it, you know, you want to open the scripture and be like, now let me tell you how I'm the one who's getting all of this right. They make it look like they're serving God, they're the righteous ones, they have their their phylacteries are long, their fringes are long, these are religious garments, okay, that were instructed, and so they're wearing these, and they wanted to be really prominent. So when they walk into a room, everybody knows, like, here they are. Here's the religious leaders, they're walking in, they really want the seats of honor, they want to get all the, all the power to themselves, everything is about them and who they are and what they do, and Jesus is going to identify the fundamental problem with them. They're self-righteous, which means the word he's going to continue to use is that they're hypocrites. Now, some of you may know this, but a hypocrite is a deceiver. It's a liar, but in the first century context especially, and even through other centuries, it was used primarily to describe actors because an actor is a deceiver. That's what an actor is doing, right? It's, it's used in a positive sense because when you go to a Broadway play or something, right, like the and you can see this more on Broadway or on live performances than you can in TVs and cinema because they obviously can like CGI everything to make you believe it. But when you're in a live show or you're watching a Broadway performance, the actor is intentionally trying to deceive you into making you believe that the actor is the per actually the person that he or she is playing. And so you gauge their performance when you leave. Was this actor good or bad or whatever based on how well did I believe that they were the person they were acting? Like, how well did I get drawn into the performance? How did I, you know, how did they make me feel? You allow yourselves to get to that space because you know the actor is not the person that they are playing. But it happens so powerfully for us that we begin to equate those two things because you can do it, you can think of an actor or two who you identify them with their most prominent role. Like, if, if Steve Carell walked into this room right, right now, we would go, it's Michael Scott. And you go, that's not Michael Scott, that's Steve Carell. 
But and our, our initial thought, I promise you, for at least half of us would be, holy cow, Michael Scott just walked in. But he's not. It's just that he's good at it. He's just a fic- Michael Scott's a fictional character embodied by Steve. So hypocrisy is deception. And the Pharisees, what they're doing as religious leaders are deceiving, but it goes, it's worse because they're not just deceiving people. Uh, they're just not perpetuating the deception about themselves. But what they're doing is they're portraying a standard of living and of righteousness that they themselves weren't actually able to keep. But when people watched them, and they saw them, and they perpetuated this deception, the people around them began to believe, oh, I need to be like them. I need to do that. I need to live that lifestyle. And they just make it look like they are. So, so you might think to yourself, oh, I'm not a hypocrite, right? I'm not a deceiver. Everyone wants, no, no, no. I just, I'm an open book. I try to be as real as possible. Everyone knows who I am. Does your social media feed match who you are in real life? Does it, because we have been given the tools to be deceptive in our society, and all of us buy in. All of us do it. If your social media feed is almost certainly not an accurate description of what is actually happening in your life. And people deceive on social media in at least three ways. It can be, and listen, social media can be good, but it can also be a very powerful weapon for the negative. And we all use it to deceive in three ways. Number one, sometimes we deceive others by posting about only the good things because we don't want them to know. It's, we actually do it in order to cover the bad things that are happening in our life. I had a friend, uh, it was one of my sister's friends actually, who had a job that looked amazing, right? So she would post on social media all the vineyards that she visited. It, you know, she would go to these wineries, these beautiful places, because she worked for a, a wine distribution company. So she'd go to all these different places, and there'd be pictures of her with wine, you know, the selfies the girls do that are like from the top, like I guess the way God looks at you. And so they, so they have, you know, she's got her glass of wine, and she's at all these beautiful places. And you would think if you were looking at it, like, oh, my goodness, this is like, this is the life. I mean, she's nailing it. She's young. You know, she's, but what you didn't know is that she was going through a divorce. So you'd look at her social media feed, and you'd be like, wow, that's amazing. But, like, in real life, her life was troubled. She was struggling. Sometimes we deceive others um, by just never acknowledging the bad, right? Like, we post only the good things. Like, we're not, we don't think we're trying to deceive, but there's times when, you know, you post a picture uh, when your kids are playing together, right? Like, on the playground. You know, when you're like, oh, look how sweet my three children smiling and playing together. But you don't post the next one when they're punching and biting each other. Sometimes we deceive others by acting one way in person, but our social media feed is the complete opposite of what we present when we meet people. Like, we act like we're caring and we love everybody around us, but we get online and we post the most incendiary things. So who are we deceiving? Is it any wonder that there is such stress and anxiety in our country that by far and away over the last 10 years, regardless of the pandemic, whatever, stress and anxiety-related illness is off the charts? Is it any wonder when we're literally surrounded by liars? Every one of us. We're surrounded by people who are portraying something to us that they can't actually live into, but when we see it, we begin to think, but if they can do it, so should I. It's just that it's not true. It's a fake picture. And the problem is that, again, social media has given us a platform to just deceive everyone around us into thinking we're better, smarter, well-off than we actually are. I'm not saying we intend to do it, but I am saying that's what happens. And the problem with a life of deception is not, it's not a pathway to freedom. But for you as an individual, but listen to this, the real issue that Jesus has is not in what it's doing to you as an individual when you're living in deception. It's actually what it's doing to the people around you. And that's consistent with Jesus' teaching throughout this series on the kingdom of heaven, where Jesus' teaching has always been, he does not focus on our personal righteousness. He focuses on how we treat the people around us. The problem with your deception is not about what it's saying about you, but it's on how it relates to your, to your friends, the people that are watching you, and how it makes them feel like they have to live into some standard that you yourself can't even live into. I'll give you an example of what this looks like, because if I posted a picture on social media of my family around the dinner table, and all the children were smiling and they were happy, and, you know, one had the arm around another, and they were eating all the food that Ma and Pa put on the table, and we were having the, and I took a picture, and I was like, man, you guys would all look at it and be like, wow, 
they are nailing it. They're doing it with six kids. Like, that's obviously the standard that I have to live into. You know, like, that's amazing. Wow, if they can do it, why can't I do it? You know, but, like, when you're sitting around with your kids, especially if you have teenagers, and they're antagonizing their siblings, they're giving one-word responses to your questions, they're refusing to eat the food, they're yelling at each other, You'd, and you saw this perfect picture up there on social media. Then you look at your family, and you're like, we're terrible, you know? Like, we're not, we're not nailing it. Like, man, they're doing it. We're not doing it. And you begin to let this guilt and shame sneak in because you're not living into the standard that someone else is. But the problem is, that, per- that perfect picture of the family sitting around the table all smiling, and doing, that's not real. If I'm lucky, that might happen one time a year. We sit at the dinner table as a family probably, let's say, ha- half the nights. Let's say 150 times a year. If I could get one photo of the family sitting there like they were really enjoying it. First of all, if you looked closer, I guarantee you what happened was I went out to Maggie's in Wayne, which is our favorite restaurant, and I bought the kids exactly what they wanted to eat so that everyone got to pick exactly the food they wanted that night, and I brought it home, and they smiled, and I spent way more money than I could afford and put it on a credit card because I'd rather be in debt than go through that pain and agony one more night with the family (laughs) at the table. And you wouldn't know any of that. You'd just see the picture, and you'd be like, wow, amazing. I mean, it's a real moment, right? It might happen. I want to capture that moment, but we have to acknowledge the reality that what it's doing is making other people feel like they aren't living up to the standard because in reality, that picture is not really what's going on in my life the vast majority of the time. Jesus' instruction to his disciples is, don't draw attention to yourself. Don't hold yourself up as the standard. There's only one person who gets the glory. There's only one person who gets to interpret the scripture. There's only one person who gets to show off his righteousness, only one person who gets to set the standard for how the people of God should live, and that's Jesus. Don't desire that anyone call you instructor. Don't make yourself the center of attention. You trace how that plays out in the early church, and even in Jesus' teaching and then in the apostles and the early preachers, Jesus is the one who sits on the Moses seat. When we gather for worship, You know, when we gather together, Jesus is the one through whom we interpret the scripture. Jesus provides the authoritative interpretation of all of the scripture. So Paul would later say, you know, not many of you should desire to be teachers. You know, Paul would, but Paul would say teachers are given as gifts to the church. You know, so preachers and teachers are given as gifts to the church, but the goal of preaching and teaching is to lift up Jesus as the center of righteousness. Jesus is the picture. Jesus is the instructor, not the person preaching. But it's so insidious, and it happens so often, even in the modern church, where, I mean, I remember for myself, and, you know, this is a confession because of how it can come out, but I would walk into conferences, and I would walk into large events, and I've heard other people say this too. I would go in, and I'd think, oh, I could be on stage. Oh, I, oh, I could be up there. Like, literally walk into a conference as, like, a 25-year-old and thinking, like, well, as long as I'm here, I should probably be on stage. And you go, that's, that's rid- now that I'm older, I realize what a ridiculous thing to do. I mean, not, first of all, the, the sin and the pride and the arrogance and all of that, that's evident in it. But when you think about it, you go, I've also seen how broken most of those people are. I've talked to people, we see it all around us, people who get to that level. And then what happens? They don't have the character to sustain the influence that they've gotten around themselves because they were making it about them. They weren't really pointing to Jesus. Run towards humility. Everyone is on an equal plane in the kingdom of God. We are all siblings in God's kingdom under one instructor, Jesus. Don't set yourself up as the hero, or you're going to make yourself a liar. Jesus is going to go on uh, in this passage in Matthew 23, and he's going to talk about what he says are seven woes. He's going to say seven times over, woe to you, Pharisees and scribes, you hypocrites. Except for one time, he's going to call them blind guides, which... I don't know if that's any better. Woe to you, you hypocrites. What is he saying woe to them about? What's the problem? Well, what he's saying in what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 23 is the impact of self-righteousness. What he's going to say is, here's the problem with the Pharisees, you're self-righteous, but here's the reason why the judgment of heaven is going to be poured down on you. Here's the reason why I'm going to say woe to you, because of how it impacts the people around us. So we're going to look at these seven things that Jesus says, uh, each of them, and see how self-righteousness breeds this sort of reality. Some of them we'll look at more deeply than others. We're not going to look very deeply at all seven because we don't have the time. Here's the first one, he says. Self-righteous people shut the door of the kingdom in other people's faces. Jesus' words are this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Self-righteous people always want to be the ones who determine who's in and who's out. You'll know you're dealing with a self-righteous person because they will have a very clear line on who is in the kingdom of heaven and who isn't. What type of people make it? What type of people don't? What are the characteristics of those who are in? What are the characteristics of those who aren't? What's the political party of those who are in? What's the political party of those who are out? Self-righteous people will always shut the door in in other people's faces. That functionally, self-righteous people want to hold the keys to the kingdom and determine who is going to get the gate shut in their faces. And by the way, as we're getting into this, you know, I have to say that the problem when we talk about self-righteousness is that every single one of us in here, myself included, wants to go, I know somebody who needs to hear this. That we really need to evaluate, like, is Jesus talking to me? Is, is there something here that I need to be hearing? Um, here's the second one. Self-righteous people always multiply self-righteousness exponentially. Have you ever noticed that self-righteous people breed self-righteous people? This is what Jesus says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, a convert, and when he becomes a convert, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. First of all, let's not move too quickly beyond the fact that Jesus called those in the kingdom of heaven children of the Father, of God. And now he says self-righteous people are children of hell, and when you convert someone to your line of thinking, you make them twice the son of hell as you are. Self-righteousness always multiplies exponentially. And I have to say, I've seen this happen. When you center yourself, okay, when you make yourself the standard, you begin to attract people around you who are attracted to that standard, and then they try to live into it, and they do become just a convert of your own self-righteousness. Self-righteous people breed self-righteous. Chances are, if you meet one self-righteous person, they're surrounded by self-righteous people. And I have seen this happen with people who don't even intend it to happen, um, like, and, and... in pastors' groups, I, it's like, we'll get together as pastors. It's happened on more than one occasion. One guy, well-meaning, I'm sure, will always start out like this. You know, I just, I was uh, pastoring my family this week, which always, I'm like, come on, all right. I was pastoring my family this week, I was praying with my wife and my kids, and, uh, you know, it's just a real blessing. And by the way, they always whisper. That's how you know it's like, it's about to come straight from the Spirit. So he says it in a quiet voice. I just passed through my family, just praying with him, bro. And then someone else will pipe up, except they speak even quieter, because now they're going to, here, here comes the spiral, okay? Yeah, 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 I was, uh, that's true. I was pastoring my family, too. I prayed with my wife for 24 hours straight this week. And uh, my kids, they all got converted. And um, one of them, Jimmy's training to be a minister. Then another person, yeah, you know, I was, uh, I was pastoring my family this week. And I, I prayed, I had 24 hours, that's great, but I did 30 hours straight prayer for my wife and uh, all of my kids. Um, and, and it's, the, I'm exaggerating, okay? But barely. I, I just want to be, like, I'm exaggerating, but like, I've watched this happen where somebody gets up and they make a statement that's obviously self righteous, and the next person to speak has to one up them with a little bit more self righteousness. And then the third person, and, and it's like, it, and eventually, like, if God has given you in the moment, if you didn't accidentally start participating in it, which we usually do, right? Because, like, I didn't say that I was the fourth guy. I didn't tell you what I said, you know? But it's like you start to go, you, if you open your eyes to it, you're like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Like, we're not doing, whatever we're saying is not intended to build Jesus up. It's intended to build us up, and everybody else is taking the bait. You've made a convert to your way of thinking, and they're going to be twice as much a son or daughter of hell as you. Number three, self-righteous people are always primarily concerned with what they bring to the table. Jesus says, woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold? or the temple that has made the gold sacred. And he goes on to point out the fact that self-righteous hypocrites always miss the fact that the point is never about what you are doing or bringing to the table. But self-righteous people always focus on what they did, what they brought to the table, and never the fact that it's the table, it's the altar, that it's the God of heaven that brings any value. But they brag about what I did. 
They always want you to know, oh, here's what I did. Here's where I served. Here's what I gave. Here's all these things. But, they go, but what, who cares? That's, you're, just, you're spinning your tires if it's not for the God of the universe actually using any of our actions to advance his kingdom. Number four, self-righteous people focus on the minors of the law and ignore the majors. Listen to Jesus' words. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. We need to sit on this for a second. We need to sit here and think this one through. Because the Pharisees, you want to talk about righteous. I mean, they're so diligent in following the law, that if the law says that they have to give 10% of everything they have, they're like, okay, I'm gonna, they go over to their spice cabinet, well, 10% of mint, 10% of some dill, 10% of their cumin, and they bring it over and they, they give it, see, look at me, I'm doing it, I'm nailing it, 10% of everything, even to the smallest spices in my spice cabinet. How's your generosity? Now notice what Jesus says. He tells them, don't stop doing that, that's good, that's commanded, you're following the law. The problem is that you did all of that and neglected the things that actually mattered. You neglected the weightier matters of the law. You did all the minors, you were great at doing all the minors, all the easy things, the low-hanging fruits, you would grab those off, but you neglected anything that would cost you something or require you to give up yourself to help your neighbor. You neglected the majors. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You neglected to love others because you were so worried about your own personal righteousness and getting everything just right. Tithing, even to the smallest pieces in your cabinet, might look like righteousness, but it doesn't really cost you anything. What you're, what you're doing is you're, you're using righteousness in the law like a strainer to, to sift the liquid, to sift your flour, whatever it is, because you got a little gnat in there, and you're like, if I can get my righteousness just right, I'll get this gnat out, because I don't want to eat a stupid little gnat. I don't want to eat it, so I'm going to strain out the gnat. And Jesus goes, but you're a moron, because you're trying to strain out the gnat while you're trying to swallow a camel. That you're, you're trying to strain out the little thing without realizing that you're completely ignoring the camel that you're trying to put down your throat. It's idiotic. Jesus is like, you have literally missed the forest for the trees. You've literally focused on the one single sapling of your sin without recognizing and acknowledging that the kingdom of heaven is the forest. And you're neglecting the forest. You're neglecting the fact that the law, that God's instruction was about justice and mercy and faithfulness, and it wasn't about whether or not you're tithing 10% of your dill. But you're focusing on the minors and not the majors. Have you ever... When have you offered justice and mercy? When have you been faithful to the values of the kingdom, to care for the oppressed, the outcast, the fatherless, the widow, the poor? When have you done those things? We focus on the wrong things so often and major in the minors so often that we could probably spend the rest of the day highlighting how we do that. We don't have time. Straining a gnat while swallowing a camel. Jesus says self-righteous people always want the exterior clean but leave the inside dirty. Self-righteous people clean the cup, but they're dirty on the inside. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You make yourself look good, look righteous, say the right things, but inside you're like, poof, it's dirty on the inside. Cup's clean on the outside, dirty on the inside. He goes a little deeper in number six. Self-righteous people are filled with death, but they pretend to look like life, like that beautiful mausoleum. You see, whenever you go into any graveyard and you look at it and go, somebody spent more money on that than I spent on my house, but what's it filled with? Death. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones. In all uncleanness, so you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Self-righteous people are deceivers. This is how he closes. Number seven. Self-righteous people fail to acknowledge their complicity in the sins of their fathers. 
Listen to what Jesus says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus, you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murder the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation." Because you have failed to acknowledge how you have been complicit in the sins of your father. You are going to receive their judgment on you. There's this view within the American church and American evangelicalism that attempts to say that people living now should not be held accountable for the sins of the previous generations. Topics of racial reconciliation come up and everybody wants to say, hey, I didn't own slaves. I didn't do it. Don't talk to me about that. I w well, if I had lived then, I wouldn't have done that. How, how can you reconcile that with what Jesus says right here? Where he literally says, you're going to receive the judgment that's on your fathers because you're a liar and a hypocrite and you're complicit in it the way they are. He actually says to them, you are going to be responsible for all of the blood that was shed from the righteous blood of Abel, the first death in the Bible, to the blood of Zechariah, the prophet. None of them were even alive when that happened. And he goes, you murdered them. You did it. They go, no, 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 not us. And he says, see, that's the problem. Self-righteous people always want to put the blame on somebody else. They always want to put the blame elsewhere. When we live in a society where, like this weekend, we see once again a racially, I mean, listen, we know gun crimes. It could be racially motivated. It could be not be. This one was racially motivated. You're just going to the store innocently, and you get killed for no other reason than the color of your skin in America. And you go, well, that's crazy. Okay, but why is that the way it is? And why is Christian people would be like, well, that's somebody else's fault, not my fault. Maybe we ought to start thinking about how we, maybe Jesus' words to us matter so that we don't become self-righteous people who fail to acknowledge the complicity in our forefathers' sins. Maybe we say, let's think about that. What have I, have I, like, acknowledge, repent, turn, realign with the kingdom. Self-righteousness just wants to protect the self, but the righteousness of the kingdom is willing to repent to protect others. And this is bad news. This is, Jesus says this is bad news because Jesus says to him, the judgment is on you. The judgment of God is going to be poured out on this generation. And I can't help but wonder as I think about this, how many of the challenges that the church has faced, how many challenges that we want to chalk up to persecution are actually God's judgment poured out on the church? the loss of influence in the world, declining attendance on Sunday mornings, social and cultural battles happening all around us. Maybe we're far too quick to place the blame on the darkness of the world when what we ought to be doing is considering whether or not it's our own darkness that's the problem, our own failure to repent, our own failure to change. Maybe we're the blind guides. Maybe we've been the hypocrites. But Jesus never leaves us with bad news. He leaves with good news and he ends with hope. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It sounds like a judgment, but right in the center, Jesus says this to him. He goes, but if you would just turn, if you would turn back to me, it's an intentionally feminine image of a mother taking her, her hen, the hen coming out and getting her brood back under her wings to keep them safe from the coming judgment. And Jesus is saying, if you just would have turned, that all throughout Scripture, the slightest turn, just the slightest repentance, not like, not major overhaul, just, a, just, okay, a slight turn. And God's like, okay, slate's wiped clean, welcome back. The slightest turn. 
we receive grace. The slightest turn, we're back in the fold. Jesus says, if you would have just turned, I don't care what you did. I don't care what about all this, your complicity and your forefather's sins. I don't care about any other self-righteousness. If you would have just turned, man, I'd have put you right under my protective cover and saved you from the coming judgment. All you got to do is turn. There's nothing that we can't turn from to live in alignment with the kingdom of God. This passage doesn't leave us hopeless because we have the chance. They had the, the religious leaders, they didn't turn. Jesus says you're not going to turn, so your house is going to be left desolate. That's not us. Over and over and over again, God forgives the littlest step towards repentance. God wipes the slate queen, clean. God is quick to forgive. He's quick to receive, quick to cover and shelter. The question is, are we secure enough in our own righteousness to refuse to be covered by his? Are we secure enough in our own righteousness to refuse to be covered by his? Or will we repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? That's the message of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, this is a heavy passage that we all need to sit with, to reflect on, Lord, the areas of dirt, brokenness, sin that are still inside the tomb of our hearts that you need to clean out. Father, let us not be people who fake it. Let us not be people who lie about who we are, but be real about who we are. We're broken people saved by Christ. Needy people in need of a Savior. Lord, people who sin, who fail to help our fellow brother and sister, who fail to seek the good of the world, people, Lord, who need you, who need your empowering presence. Be with us, Lord. In your name, amen. Would you please stand if you're able to join me? Sometimes it's hard to think about singing a song after hearing a sermon like that. Um, so if you're feeling convicted and you want to use this time to maybe just talk to the Lord about what's on your heart, um, you can do that. But I also encourage you and invite you to join us as we sing Speak to the Mountains. And there's lyrics in here. That say, my God is bigger, he is better, he is stronger, he is greater than you and me. And praise Jesus for that. So let's sing this together.
Father, we leave now in your grace, Lord, knowing that we are your people who've turned towards you, who follow you to seek to live in alignment with how you called us to live. May we be people, Lord, that simply demonstrate uh, who our Savior is. We say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. That's how I live. I live in alignment with the values of this kingdom so the world would see us and say they're different. And Lord, your kingdom would come. Be with us now, Lord, as we go in your name. Amen. Have a great week.